four, 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 four. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to the EG Pot of Thunder with your boy, the young Lysian Key Sweat. And to the left, my guy, he was the former director of operations at Brain FM and now currently the lead of life cycle marketing at 10% Happier. My guy, one of my best friends in the world, one of my favorite travel partners of all time, my guy, the Steven Montoya at Montoya Mania on Instagram and all social medias. What's up, my guy? Good evening. Hey, hello. That is the current the classic steve montoya <laughs> and um you know what's crazy like i say i have a good amount of group i have different friend groups all plenty of different people in there and you have to be one of the most requested guests that people are like why the hell has steve not been on the podcast yet and like well one answer is because he wanted to do it in person we thought about maybe doing it via like skype or something like that but we want to get the full effect of being in person together in the studio and being the most requested guest, also, like, even amongst a friends group, you have to be the number one ask about friend I have. Wow. But every friend group is always, where's Steve at? What's he been doing? Where's Steve at now? Well, where are you guys going together next? And um, you know, I think that intrigue is because you keep, you're always authentic to yourself. Like, everything you do, you do it f to your full potential. And I think people can see that you're not trying to be someone you're not. And where do you think you can attribute like those characteristics of like just, you know, just being that person where you're intrigued and you're doing different things. And like, where do you think that like was sparked up in your like in your head? Like, where can you attribute that to? Well, first of all, that was a fantastic intro. Uh, only for the best. Only for the best. Only for the best. There it is. There it is. Either one of them worked, honestly. <laughs> that um, was a dope one. I always mess that one up. But yeah, thank you for that. That was your intro for the one of the best, most intrigued, most requested guests so far. Yeah, no, uh, thanks. Um, the question was, you know, where do I attribute it to? I think I have a lot of energy and love for a whole bunch of things. And it comes from a, a sense to see things from, from different points of view. So I have like the classic example, right? And for those who don't know me, I like to dip my toes in a, in a bunch of different things. I like to travel, like to start um, different hobbies, move to different cities, um, try different careers. and Man of many different interests. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes from, yeah, that mindset of, of just being an explorer, um, being uh, someone who's just intellectually curious. So in my head, I'm like thinking, I'm like, I want to see it a little glimpse of what everyone's life is about. So, for example, a, um, like a, um, well, can we say let's take it back from the start? So you said, so that's how your mindset is right now. Do you think that was always a part of like your identity? Like, do you think back in high school, do you think that you're the same person you are that you are now? No, I mean, I was different. I had long, juicy, dripping wet Jerry curls. <laughs> Right, um, looking like Prince, like yeah, yeah. But I would let my ima imagination kind of run away with me. Um, the example I was using, I was going to use before, is like a biker, right? Like a biker, I would want to see the how a biker sees life, how they go through life, and I'm talking about like the ones that are in bike clubs who are crossing the entire U.S. And I want to see, you know, what it's like to be someone who wrangles lions. You know, and I met a, a, a lion wrangler in South Africa, and his life was fascinating. He has a, a scar from here down from being scratched by a baby lion, and I'm like, your life is amazing. <laughs> I wouldn't, I would not want it, but see, catching a glimpse of it kind of, it, it expanded Peter my interest, heart. And you're yeah. like, I, if he can do that, I can do that. Yeah, and I don't know where it came from as a kid. Um, probably just spending too much time online, spending too much time. <laughs> We're all star hip hop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's what's yeah. going on next? Oh yeah. shit, this motherfucker got bit by a lion. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's stuff like that that I think you know it just grows over time. And then um, when I first traveled internationally, I think was um, by myself was was in high school as well. And was, I don't even know that. I didn't know that was your first time traveling internationally by yourself. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just Canada, but like you know, I was in I was in Montreal by myself, and um, I really I I was fortunate enough to have a dad who worked for the airlines who gave me like standby tickets. So I was like, let me just go to, let me go to get long, let me go to Canada. Um, so you went there like absolutely dope, like not even meeting nobody there. Yeah, like no. No, just like had a little hotel, and you know. So for someone like me and you, that's nothing. So that's 
that's why sometimes I don't even give myself credit sometimes as well. And it's like, yeah, I'll go travel to Ireland by myself. I'll go to Portugal by myself. No big deal at all. But to like the average person where they're like, wow, you guys are doing that. Like, so when you're that young at, you know, senior in high school, you had no fear at all, even at that point. I don't think so. Yeah. Cause I think like, what's the worst that can happen? You'll, you can be, <laughs> the worst that can happen is you run out of money and then you're stuck there. Right. So I kind of try and problem solve. Like if that were to happen, right. What would I have to do? I'd have to like find some sort of, of medium. I'd have to go into the embassy and you just start problem solving that way. And then you realize it's like, it's not that big of a deal. The odds of that are very low anyway. Um, and so might as well take the risk. And once you take that risk, once you jump, and and you do it in a way that's outside of your comfort circle, then you realize a it's not that scary, but most importantly b it was so much more fun than you thought it'd be. You get to meet all these different types of people. You get to catch a glimpse into a different culture that's not your own, and you yeah you have that like your bubble then of of comfort is just that much more wide. You know no definitely I agree. I mean obviously I think you know we have similar interests. It's kind of crazy how similar we both are. But, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, like, what's you and like Steve's mindset on, on things. And this is the podcast where you're going to find out Steve's mindset on his travels, his work ethic, his um, I think that's going to be a concept of this podcast where, you know, you have to conquer your fear. And I think you're a big person who conquers your fear and does what they want to do. So those who are interested, tune into this entire thing. We're going to get deep dive into it. And um, yeah, so, you know, you're saying that um, you're conquering your fear. If you had, um, you know. First of all, do you have any? I don't think I've asked you this question before. Do you think you have any fears, like at all? Like, what was like your biggest fear in life? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not so much like a big existential fear. I'm not afraid of dying or like thinking about the thought of death. Um, I'm not afraid of like losing the things that I have. I think it's it's just the fear of not doing the most. I guess giving my full effort in something. So that's honestly like that the something that that kind of haunts me and the work that I do which it'll get to a point where I I've it, it could be a little bit toxic you know where it's like you know you're just I I I I sometimes you you're not afraid of a failure you're more afraid of of not success you know so if that makes any sense yeah so you're th you're saying that you know you're just so focused on getting to your end goal so sometimes you can be you can leave certain things and not pay full attention to what's currently in front of you yeah exactly exactly for for example right like this past weekend um and we can go into you know what i do and stuff but um, I was setting up for the company some, some campaigns for Black Friday and stuff. And, you know, the weeks that, that we'd work be 50, 60 hour weeks easily. Um, and I'd find myself meticulously trying to make things even better, even at like the last minute count. Um, while like, you know, tomorrow these Black Friday emails are being sent out. And today I'm trying to make it that much better so we can have that much more revenue so that, you know, our goals are that much bigger and we build on each other. And that's that's the kind of stuff that that um, obsesses like I'm a I'm find myself obsessed with lately. But I think a lot of the other things fall behind because of that. So it might not necessarily be something that's um, that's healthy, so to speak. Would you what would you say? Guess left behind and those those certain instances i've gained weight i've gained you see this gut i've gained some weight hey, you're um, rocking it you're rocking it good though you're rocking it <laughs> i i wear it pretty pretty okay but no i i think stuff like that you know I, an overall healthy lifestyle you know and we're in a culture that kind of glorifies or, or tries to glorify um you know working beyond one's limits and, and things of that nature but it comes at a cost right I think not only health, but the the stress will will make you overall just like I I think a bit less healthier. You know, uh, there there's other things that get get left behind like that, like other relationships as well, um, or just you know not being able to have energy at the end of the day because you know you have it focused in one place. But you don't think that makes you like the person you are though. At the same time, you might leave stuff in the back the back burner. But at the same time, if you don't have that certain drive, maybe you wouldn't end up where you currently are right now. And for those who don't know, we went to high school together. That's how we met. We met in Rhode Island, but Steve has taken the journey, and that's what he's talking about, conquering his fear. He has taken that leap to New York. So he currently resides in New York. That's a big leap in itself. You know, a lot of people talk about doing stuff, and they don't do it. So, um, you know, do you think you'd be currently in New York if you didn't have that drive where you're saying sometimes it can be, you know, detrimental to yourself and your health? 
Oh, no. I live a beautiful life. <laughs> I live a beautiful life. And I think that's that um, it, it is, you know, because because of that grind, being able to get the things that I foresee in myself. Um, and, you know, listen, I'm just saying the, the, the kind of negative aspects of it. But, you know, I yeah, I live in, in the best city in the world. I I truly think New York City is the best city in the world. I wouldn't want to move out of there. Um, a couple times a year, I'll, I'll spend, you know, up to a month in Hawaii. I, I have every other Friday technically off. So it's like, you know, the people that I'm with, I have a beautiful girlfriend with me, you know. So, like, I'm living, uh, I think, what I, what I would call a dream to myself if I was in, you know, if I was in high school. Yeah, I, I foresaw myself, like, in a loft in, in New York City. And I'm like, oh, my God, that that future just seems, like, amazing. And now I'm in it, and I'm like, yes, that's amazing, even though. Yeah, I want to definitely get back to high school, but you're saying, like, New York and living a beautiful life. Like, so what is, like, your end goal at the end of the day? So you're saying, you know, sometimes you're talking about the negative first, but what would be, like, that end goal right now, most like in the back of your head? Honestly, I don't know. I, I, um, I think about this quote, and any of you Game of Thrones um uh you know watchers out there um when when one of the characters said you know chaos is a ladder i got that because i'm like for a lot of it, it's like the climb you know and and i get that sense of like when you know when i've talked to incredibly wealthy people some of them have you, you know said the same thing that's about the climb more so than the destination um climbing mountains is the same you know after a while the the peaks will will look you know similar but that climb is what makes it worth it so i think Finding something where I can dedicate, you know, a majority, a majority part of my life is something that I love. So maybe the, an end goal that would be would just like, I don't know, having some type of, of avenue where I can easily create that for myself, whether it's having a chain of, of businesses that I'm, you know, working with and working through and like building um, all with a purpose of at the end of the day, though, um, not doing it for no reason, not doing it for greed. I think at the end of the day, it has to have some net positive for humanity, right? Because uh, otherwise, you know, it's going in the opposite direction, and and that's not what I'm about. You know, definitely, I agree. But do you ever get scared that you might get caught up in the climb where you never know and you don't have a destination? Yeah, yeah, for sure, uh, for sure. You know, where where it's just like you're you're working or just to work, or you're climbing just to climb. So I I think there's um, milestones that you should hit for yourself, right? There's milestones to ensure that where it's like you know make my first x by doing y or by having you know this this certain position or this certain company um and then from there having having you know something else like do you, I, have, do you have any milestones you have in the back of your head yeah i think you know where i'm at right now um in, in my marketing career i see myself within the next kind of year or so being up in the top of 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 my field and and my field right now is life cycle marketing i moved over from from operations to um, more growth growth marketing um, and i was in a conference a couple weeks ago i was at a conference with the best in the world were there as far as like life cycle marketing so life cycle is is email push notifications in app it's it's pretty much everything from acquisition so how you get a, a customer to how, getting them interested to getting them to purchase to getting them to be a super fan of your product um, and specifically in, in SaaS companies where it's a sales as a service, um, software as a service, um, and, um, and really getting them, um, so it's like the monthly subscription services where, where you're talking about high volume number of customers in the, in the thousands, hundred thousands, millions, et cetera. Um, and, and I was seeing brand, big brands up there, like Burger King was up there. I saw one of the CMOs in Netflix, um, and she said a really cool story about, about Netflix and the pandemic and stuff that I can share that I, th I thought was really cool. You know, that's dope. Yeah, because I can tell you for sure, I've never had anybody in the podcast yet that has been to one of these conferences. And, you know, I have a variety of different podcasts. I've had funny ones, comedy ones, talking about a whole bunch of different stuff. But people definitely enjoy the business aspect of the podcasting too. And um, I'm sure people listening are intrigued on this right now. So, you know, how did you even get into that field in the first place coming from a small, the smallest state in Rhode Island? You know, how did you dip your toes in that? Because if, I mean, was that like your major in college? No, I was a finance major in college. So I have, I had a weird path that took me there. Um, so out of college, I went and became a financial advisor in Boston. I was working for this financial advisory company that was commission only. So I had to, 
essentially sell, you know, at like, like our goal was to get like a hundred thousand in assets under management. So that's like talking to, you know, your parents at the time, talking to other people's parents at the time, young professionals trying to get their um, 401ks rolled over to my companies so that we can manage them. And, and the commissions will be, will be like decently big, you know, like 10, like 10, sometimes 20 K or so. But the turnaround time on that was like four months. So let's say I sold you today and you're like, yes, I will roll over all of my money, all of the money I've been, I've been holding for so long um, in my 401k is going to you. Uh, it would still take because there's like paperwork, there's clearances, there's like a whole bunch of, of just like things that go on in the back. And it'll take four months before I get paid on that. And that was pure commission. And I was still living at my mom's in Outer World. So I was like taking the train up and I was just like, yo, like I can't live like this. So I did almost a year of that. Um, was that that entire time you were just like, I'm just doing this just to build up my resume. You had no intention of staying there for the long term. Well, it was interesting because it, I, I loved finance, right? It, in college, I actually, this was before the, the wave that happened, by the way, in like the past eight years. I started learning Forex like eight years ago. Sorry, what is Forex? Uh, foreign exchange currency trading. So that's okay. like, you know, euro, US dollar, like all the, all the trading. I know it's a, a bit bigger now. Um, it was so much so that I gave my thesis at Rhode Island College in, in finance on the topic of Forex trading. And my professor had no idea what it was. That's nuts. He, he was just like, okay, he's like, I know it's like a thing. Like it, the technical trading is a thing, but we don't know nothing about it. We talk about fundamentals here. And that's like, you know, two different ways that finance is like it's it's um down at the moment but anyway so I, I loved finance and i went to this fun to, to this financial advisory company like oh my god yes i'm gonna be able to choose the stocks choose the bonds choose everything um for these investment firms or learn how to do that and i found out that it was just a like it was a glorified sales position i was on phones trying to sell people it more than I was managing it. So just for those who are hearing that, they're like, wow, okay, maybe they're intrigued in that. So you're finding that out firsthand after you graduated. How how would you have known that it wasn't a sales position? Like, should you have talked to someone beforehand or what was like, how would, how would you have prevented that? That's a great question. Looking back, I would have been like, what yeah what does a day in the life look like what are my my goals for the first month coming in like in the interview process and i think it would have been really clear like oh we're gonna and like avoid that like predatory language of like oh you're gonna make x y and z or we're gonna get you to make x y and z and just poke into that like oh great how and if it's like we're gonna go out and you're gonna call a hundred two hundred three hundred people a day and and try and get and like and we're gonna sell them then it's a sales position but so you're saying that right now, obviously sales position, you said the turnover time is kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, but the only thing that kind of down the line, it kind of gives you those attributes where you kind of use them now in the marketing position. Like we're fast forwarding a lot, but it's like, you know, that kind of helps you out. So, yeah. Yeah. So that, but you can continue your story. So we're not fat, jumping back and forth between no, topics. So you know, what's crazy. It's one thing I learned there. I learned, um, as a financial advisor, the way that we would get leads is that we would go on to Upwork and hire someone from like Pakistan or whatever, um, a lead generator who would have some of these like programs that's like, I don't know if like Salesforce is one of them, um, but they would have a whole bunch of programs where they could look up people's information. And so I would say, hey, I'm looking for 500 people that fit the, this demographic, work at these companies, you know, might be this age, blah, blah, blah. And for like, 150 bucks, he'll get, you know, 200 people back. Emails, first names, last names, phone number. So fast forward when I'm at Brain FM. Um, kind of setting the steps for you. Yeah, I oh, use that exact same system to make an affiliate outreach system. So for you uh, for you guys in, in the audience, affiliates like Instagram uh, um, influencers who want to get paid for their posts, we would reach out to them and we'd be like, hey, you know, you can make X, Y, and Z, and I would get their contact information the exact same way. I would do the outreach the exact same way, except instead of phone calls, it was email. And we're and like that program did amazing. We were able to get a lot. Isn't of, that kind of crazy well, how like yeah. life like sets you up and like you don't even think about it when you're doing that. You may be hitting at that point in your life, but down the line, you're gonna use those yeah. learning lessons. So so the forex when well, the Forex, right? Forex? Forex trading. The Forex trading. Then after that, where does your journey lead to you? Yeah. So I, I um, 
I, uh, I, I liked Forex in college. It led me to be a financial advisor. From there, I left and I did what I knew best. So in high school and in college, on the side, I was working for a gym. I was working at Interest Fitness in North Attleboro. Um, and Andy Marino, shout out to Andy Marino, um, he, it, he owns or his family, his uh, brother owns, and now he's, he's up there as well, um, a chain of gyms in, in northern Massachusetts. So I'm like, all right, I know how to sell memberships. I can do that for the time being because I'm going to quit this job and I need, I need to like rebound. So I went to Best Fitness and I started selling gym memberships there. And, and funny enough, the stuff that I learned at Best Fitness, I also take with me as well. Because this gym, I don't know if all of the gyms do this now, but the way that they would introduce the gym and sell the gym to you, for me, was like mind-blowing in the moment. And I think is actually something that I take with me in, in the concept of life cycle marketing, where you're introducing someone, someone comes into your door, and they don't, some, necess, some might come because like, I just want weights, dumbbells, and I know what I'm doing. I just want to work out. It's like, great, here's the price, pay, gone. But there's some people who are like, they want to come in because they want to lose weight, because they want to live ha ha happier, healthier lives. And, and what we did, we'd sit down with them and go over their goals. We'd sit down with them, and before they even saw the gym, we wouldn't even let them see the gym until, he's, until they filled this, this questionnaire out of like, what do you want to lose? Was that included with their membership, or was it like an extra fee? No, that's actually, uh, the minute you stepped into the gym inquiring about a membership, that, this is the process that we did. So this is like, yeah, this, this is free of charge. This is right before, this is before we even give you the pricing. Yeah, I mean, gyms definitely do that, but they charge you extra. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Right, right at the get-go, every person that comes in inquiring, they'll sit down with you, see, say what, see what your goals are. And for the purpose of like, all right, I want to lose 50 pounds. And they're like, great, how many days a week do you, do you uh, want to commit to this? And they'll make you kind of quasi-commit in there. Like, just say to yourself, I want to come in three days a week. Um, I want to come in... Um, you know, X day. And you're like, great. You want to come in three days a week, lose 20 pounds. Now let me show you the gym, show you the gym. Then they'll sit down with you and be like, make like a little, a, a plan for you. So it's like, okay, now you have a workout plan to, um, to, to lose the weight that you wanted to lose. Next up is just signing up for the gym. So I love this. So I've never done this before on the podcast. So, so at this step in your life, what did you learn that you can, you know, attribute to your current job then? I, yeah, I think so we can go step by step and then what you learn from each of your previous jobs to your current job. I th the concept of personalization, right? Like this entire thing is like the way that, that they handle is incredibly personalized where it's like as far as the language and the entire tour would be personalized to you. They'll show you specific like classes that will help you, you know, lose weight. They'll show you specific, um, you know, if you wanted to say I'm preparing for a race, they'll show you, all right, these this is the personal trainer who's ran a marathon. This is, you know, the, the different things that, um, that you can do to get in shape for that. Oh, you're looking to, to build muscle. Great. This is this, you know, 300 pounds of pure muscle guy. And, and you know, he's done like Olympic strength training. Yeah. And then they'll just say a couple words. And before you know it, like they're sold. So it was, it was ran like a machine. So it's like. So it's going to the back of your head this moment. Time. You're like, all right, I'm learning this. You're all. It's inputting in that back of your head, like, all right. It's subconscious, though. It's not like I'm going to take this moving forward. It's just when I, um, let me put this back on. When I, when I, I saw the, the kind of opportunity and I, I saw similarities, right? Um, most of the time when people come to various different apps, you're not even thinking about it. Like, you're downloading an app. You're downloading it for a reason because you download Duolingo because you want to learn how to speak French or Spanish or Portuguese. You know, you're, you're downloading some of these different apps for a different reason. So if the onboarding could could ask you, what are you here to do? And and then the communication would feed that back to you like, oh, you're here to, to learn this and this. And you're 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 dedicating this, that and the other. And then, oh, you missed the day yesterday. Come back in. By the way, bye. You know, and it's just like it is different ways on taking it in. And at the end of the day, it's all human psychology where it's like the I think a, a gym is the perfect amount of just like, it, it's like a perfect sample size of the general public because so many different people from so many walks of life would just walk into a gym. Yeah, so many. And they all act pretty much, you know, similarly, they're a consumer. So 
So I think a lot of that that consumer behavior I brought with me. So th- that was the gym. Yeah. Then was the next step in your journey. So after that, um, uh, I so this 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 is gonna this is like a hard turn. So after this, porn. No. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think in the east it's as big of a market for like I shooting. Yeah, no, I would have been into it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, <it's>, fuck. <laughs> But no, so after the gym, it was then. Uh, yeah, and then I started working for a clean energy startup. So I knew a scientist. Um, oh, who, I did not even know this. This yeah, is news yeah, to me. Yeah, exactly. So you know, I. You know what the crazy part is? So I feel like we're sh- both me and you. We're both so like sociable, personable with so many different people. But at the same time, when it comes to like business, we both are like guarded where we don't tell people what we're doing in the moment. So we have to keep our like. You know, on social media, you can say, oh, damn, Steve's here. Steve's in Hawaii. He's in Dubai. He's doing this. He's in France. He's in Asia. And then people are like, "But how? I've got asked this actually plenty of times. I don't know if I even told you. Like, what the hell does Steve do to make money? And I'm like, <laughs> to be honest, I don't even know. <laughs> like, to be honest, I don't know. So coming back to that point where it's like, I don't know, like, the full story because you're about to get into this, um, what you say, a cleaning uh, clean energy. Clean energy. Yeah. I did not even know this. So this is news to me, guys. This is an EG Pot of Thunder exclusive because <laughs> your boy and I think we're pretty good best friends. I don't even know this story. So continue on with this aspect and chapter I of your life. That. that was like no. a good two years. Wow. No, wow. I did not know this. Uh, so, yeah. So I was working with a um, a scientist who I've known for a while. And I knew him from the original gym that I worked at. He was a little bit of like a wacky guy. This guy graduated with his PhD from MIT. Never mind, you told me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I'm yeah. like, damn. But I'm surprised. I'll continue. I don't understand. Uh, so he, yeah, he graduated his PhD from MIT. He's an inventor. He's a serial inventor his entire life, and he's probably in his, like, 60s or so. His entire life, he's been living off of his inventions. He made, like, a curved lens that was, like, used in something in the aerospace industry. Anyway, he, he was, uh, I've, you know, I was talking to him, you know, randomly and I was talking to him pretty, pretty regularly, you know, reach out to me and we were just, you know, pretty, pretty close talking about various things. And he was coming up with an invention for the clean energy, um, industry. And what his invention was, was on the manufacturing of semiconductor chips that for like, at the end of the day, they go into satellites, they go into, um, batteries that are for electric vehicles they go into um, you know like some high powered devices so it's like the material that's in little chips that go for high powered material that can withstand a lot of heat so silicon carbide gallium nitride and essentially what it was is he had a method where the way that it, that it works is you grow these materials that's why it's called clean energy you literally grow them from like a little bit every little bit you can like recycle it and you put it in like this type of furnace ish and I'm dumbing it down a lot <laughs> this furnace where it grows and it, it it grows into more of it and typically what you do is you get a laser and you cut it off you cut off the wafers into what needs to be done so this man was a b- ahead of his time I had, yeah, I mean, he it was genius what he was doing. And what he, he was doing is he noticed that the way that the lasering was working, um, it was burning a lot of material. You would only through the lasering because it's like the material that you would get is like this much. And it would go into thousands, million, not thousands, tens of thousands of, of devices. So any little millimeter that you could save is like hundreds and thousands of dollars. Um, so what he found was there was a way instead of using a laser to make a microscopic crack in it that would slice it off so that it was a crack on the molecular level where you're able to control the propagation, which is like the way that it cracks. So it's not like super messy. You're able to like control it with a very, very specific amount of weight, a very specific device, and it will crack smoothly off. And that way, you would gain like 40% of it, and it would happen in one-tenth of the time that a laser took. So it was faster, and it was more efficient and cheaper. And that was that was what um, he was trying to market and bring to an industry. So what were you bringing to that project? So he had it on the science level. He needed someone to commercialize and build a business plan. So essentially what I did... But why did he pick you in the first place? So at this moment in time, you have... In your background, you have the forex, then you have the gym. 
So what did you have in like in your resume or what stood out to him for him to even offer that to you? Because that seems like a pretty high, like he's what he's doing is on a crazy different level. So why at this point, how old are you like? Maybe like 23, 24? Yeah, like so why would he chart why would he trust like a 23, 24 year old with his invention to market that? Honestly, it was just it was the rapport that I had with him. You know, I would talk to him and he'd tell me about this stuff, and I'm like, oh, if you know. I had like knowledge about building building business plans in college, but I didn't really have that type of experience. But I was like, all right, if I were to do this, I'd reach out to these people. I'd do this, that, and the other. I'd find investors. And he was like, why don't you just try it with me? He's like, I, I don't, he's like, originally, he's like, I don't have enough right now to pay you. But what we can do is try and get funding from the government and then like eventually hire a CEO and this, that, and the other. Excuse me. So I was like, all right, I'll do that. You know, I'll do that while I'm working at the gym. And, um, and then I did it and we ended up writing a proposal for, um, the small, biz, uh, like the SBIR, which is, um, it, it's a government, um, agency that pretty much awards, uh, it's the department of science that awards, um, uh, they give grants to several different companies who are trying to, to bring these inventions into the market. So we ended up getting 200,000 off of a, what's called a phase one. So he he built he wrote out it's like a paper that you submit he wrote out all the science of it and that was like seventy five percent of it and I wrote all right if we get this money this is what we're gonna do we're gonna hire um some um we're gonna hire some scientists to bring a proof of concept we're gonna shop around this proof of concept over to some investors or to um or or to these three big companies that are ones that control the entire industry and we're gonna try and we're gonna try selling the sell the patent so. Now that the public and I don't know if that many people know that story of you, but that was a pretty hard left, like you said. So, <laughs> it was a hard yeah, left. Dude. Hard left of that. <laughs> I mean, so at this point, so what would you attribute to your current job now? So now we're doing this, this is like the you know the concept of the show right now. So what did you learn from that? Like reaching out to people, and I think for that right there is networking. Like I had a podcast on for like two high school seniors uh, two weeks ago when this is being recorded, they just want the South Super Bowl or whatever. And I told them, you know, networking is key. You know, don't just be that simple, like local mindset is what I had to offer to them. It was like, you know, network me as many people as you can. You never know who you're going to meet. It's all about meeting people. So, yeah, yeah. So I think you're right there. You know, big thing is networking. And what else would you attribute to that relationship and that chapter of your life with the scientists? Um, honestly, it, it's, it's such a, I don't know. I like, uh, I, I gathered basic, I'm not basic, but like entrepreneurial sense in that aspect, um, because I also, we worked with uh, MIT, we worked with, we had a, they had a program that's called i and it's like the i uh program where you work with um, two advisors from MIT, and they, pr they help you on like the commercialization thing. And I was like, great, like I get to learn from these people who are ridiculously smart, who have started, you know, funded all, of, all these different companies. So it's, it's like finding an opportunity and just like jumping on it, networking, talking to everyone and just kind of showing how passionate you are in whatever subject that strikes your fancy during that conversation, to be honest. And then from there, you'll never know who's thinking of you about what. Yeah, like you never know and like, I don't think you would have ever met those type of people if you never met that guy and dip your toes in that type yeah. of project. Maybe you didn't get full paid what you thought you were going to get paid, but sometimes you got to take that hit because you never know what like learning lessons you're going to have during that time. And um, you know, that's why I tell a lot of people too, like you never know. He's got to even doing this podcast, like you know, I'm not getting paid, but you never know who you're going to meet. I've been hit up by a whole bunch of different people. Actually, I actually got reached out today by someone else. I've never talked to in my entire life. And they're like, hey, do you want to like work together? And like, I want to meet you over some coffee. I'm like, yeah, for sure. And I'm doing this just because I love talking to people and being intrigued and hearing stories. And like you said, like, you never know what you're going to do. And like this podcast, I don't ever have like a script. It's because I'm hearing people talking and I come up with questions while they're talking. Yeah. So like just being intrigued, like you said. Have fun with it. Yeah, let's have fun with it. And I think a lot of people too much of the time overthink too much of their like thoughts and like what they're doing next. Sometimes you have to go with the flow. Yeah. And, you know, at, at the very least as well, I had in my mind, I'm like, okay, if this doesn't pan out, because it, it's a big risk, and they're like, most likely than not, you know, most startups fail miserably, I think. I, I don't know what the rate is, but it's probably like 80, 90% just fall flat. Um, but I'm like, at the very least, it'll, it'll be great on my resume, and I'll be, I'll be able to, to toss it in there. Um, 
so yeah, definitely networking, definitely just trying an opportunity, seeing what comes of it, you know, what skills you can gain from it. Um, and, and yeah, through that, you know, we worked for a couple years. Um, we ended up hiring an interim um, CEO who works at like a, a different, like a, a, a similar company uh, now. And, you know, I'm, I'm friends with him and it, it's really cool with him. Um, and yeah, no, that opportunity was great. We ended up actually coming in we were semi-finalists for this NASA competition. That was dope. Yeah, that was it was really cool. It was a NASA competition for for particular um uh for particular innovations in um in this space. And I went to the um I went to like uh to, Mars? No, yeah, I wish. <laughs> but in there like looking at the submissions, it was like we're going to make this suit so that it's it's easy for you to be able to like withstand the temperature in Mars, and I'm like, wow, That's this is crazy. so cool. But I went I went to the the event where like the finalists were talking, and they were doing wild things. There was one company that I remember distinctively. They had a gel that you put on your windows, and in the in the winter it like kept out seventy percent of the cold, and in the summer, or I'm sorry, it, yeah. It kept out 70% of the cold. And in the summer, the same thing for the heat. So you don't have to pay as much for heating and, and air conditioning. You put like this like like clear fair, like thing on your window. And it was blowing my mind. Dude, it's like the Elon Musk of the world. I imagine all these people who like who are not Elon Musk level yet who are out there, who are coming up with these inventions. It's crazy. Like I was thinking about it like if The Walking Dead happened, I'd be fucked. Because I wouldn't know how to survive. And But there's people like Elon Musk and those type of people who are out here creating these inventions. It's nuts. Right. It is nuts. And like like you said, go, like just trying to stuff with people like that is awesome. And networking, mean, though, like just getting in those type of environments, you never know where that shit might lead to you. And like so that ends, I'm assuming. So obviously it does. So what is your next chapter after that? So after that, uh, another kind of networking thing, I was one of my really close friends is Dan Clark. Um, Shout one out of my Dan best Clark. friends. Yes, Dan Clark. And he he has an interesting journey in himself. And now he's he's the CEO of Brain FM, which is a startup um, that creates functional music to help you focus, relax, and sleep. I was a longtime subscriber of that. And it used to help me fall asleep. You know, so funny. Actually, I did my Apple um, replay, whatever it's called. And my number one song, I don't even want to post this because this is kind of funny. I'll get roasted. My number one play song of the year is a meditation song. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. It's a meditation song and then All Bad Bunny. Nice. <laughs> it's like so funny. It's number one. It's like by a mile. It's like, God damn. Mindfulness, Effie. Let's go. Yeah, dude. You got to fall asleep. You got to, you know, those, that shit. That shit is real. That shit is real. And if I didn't have Brain FM, it'd be even higher yeah. on, the, on the list. So but, actually, I jumped ahead a, a little bit. Before then, actually... Um, while I was, you know, I, I left the gym because, you know, I was doing, I was doing pretty good at the gym as far as sales wise. I was, I was probably like top three or so, like every month in sales. Um, sometimes I hit one, you know, and, and I'm talking about like this gym franchise had like 15 different clubs and stuff. So it was a lot, a lot of people in sales and, um, I was doing well, but I wasn't passionate about it. Uh, I was, it was not the life for me. I'm like, you know, I like to work when I work out, I like to box. Um, I don't necessarily like lifting weights that much. And the concept of it, it's still like broken in my mind. But like, so is so is a bunch of other stuff like you're paying to pick up heavy things and put them right, right where they're where, where they were. Um, but obviously, like we pay Ubers for like machines to pick us up and put us somewhere else. So it's like you could break <laughs> anything out down into that. Into it's, just, the, it's just not your thing. It's not my thing. It's not my thing. Uh, but you know, love, love the, the gym franchise. Um, really cool with everyone there. Um, but, but yeah, it was not my thing. So, so while I was working at the start at, um, uh, clean energy startup, OptiComp it was the name of it. Um, I was, um, you know, I was making a little bit of money because we had we had that um, that grant come through, but not a whole lot. You know, a lot of it went to scientists. A lot of it went to renting labs. A lot of it went into the material that we had to purchase to like do these experiments. So on the side, I, I picked up an operations job um, at FedEx actually. So I was working um, uh, operations at FedEx um, and kind of improving the Fed the the FedEx operations on like a QA level. We were like, you know. Um, 
finding different ways. It was like really interesting. The way that they have their routes planned was super interesting. It's like, it's really well optimized where you would think it's like, oh, there's one block away. Why aren't they delivering it? They're going in this loop. But it's like, no, it, it makes sense when you think about the number of packages that they have to hit, time of day, traffic, this, that, and the other. So I was doing operations. Um, and then meanwhile, you know, I was, again, best friends uh, with Dan Clark. And I would tell him about, you know, the woes that I, I was having working with the with um, in that in that clean energy startup, it was not easy. This uh, the my co-founder. He um, he's a very intellectual man, but would I would see why he, you know, doesn't work well with others. He butt heads. You know, science and business sometimes don't mix really well, and he just fundamentally wouldn't understand some of the concepts, or like wouldn't care to understand. Um, you know, he's super smart, so he's capable of understanding. He just wouldn't care to understand the concepts. So you felt like you weren't it. being heard. Yeah, and and it wasn't even me, or like not only me, it was me and the CEO. We were like saying like, "Yo, we gotta, we have this at a perfect level right now, where we can shop this around to investors." And he's like, "I don't get why investors would want a dime if uh, unless they're shown something that absolutely works." And I'm like, "You don't get the the concept of like." seed funding or the the concept of angel investors i'm like that's a thing where people are investing at really early stages so they get a percentage of the company etc and like and he would talk i would bring him investors and he would like talk his his way out of it and it was just like yeah at the end of the day people would leave frustrated like not even myself the people that i brought in and I'd, I'd have to apologize so it's like it started off being a little bit toxic but then you also obviously were frustrated this oh time. yeah i was so pissed i was so pissed um, so I was having that, those woes. And at, at that time, um, you know, Dan Clark was transitioning into becoming CEO at, at Brain FM. And he's like, I need someone in the operational um, aspect. You know, I see that, you know, you've built a small, a small team um, in clean energy, you know, in tech, you can move over to tech and it'll be, you know, a bit easier. Um, just a, but you brought Dan Clark out of nowhere. For those who don't know Dan Clark, just a quick backstory on that. How and I don't think I don't even know this. How did you meet Dan Clark in the first place? And where did that best friend, you know, because you're about to trans translate into the new chapter in your life. So before you start that, how did you meet Dan Clark, who is the COO, CEO, CEO yeah. of Brand FM? How did you meet him in the first place? I met. I also met him at a gym. So all you guys start talking to people at gyms. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, I, I was working there. He worked there. Um, at this was in you know, late stages of high school, or early college. Uh, I don't actually remember exactly what year, but he he was like a cleaner there once. And I remember we had this conversation he, and I was cleaning. And so I must have, yeah, I must have been in high school. And, and he was like, that job sucks, huh? And I was like, yeah. And then <laughs> we're kind of like, great. <laughs> um, and then super personable as well. Dan's oh, the other yeah. person who can just talk to anybody forever. The most outgoing person yeah. I know. He, if, if you bring him someone that's stubborn with, uh, that, uh, about speaking, he will get them to open up. You know, for sure. Yeah. So you met him at the gym. You guys bonded over the sucking of cleaning. Sucking of cleaning. Before you know it, we were out at, at like, Fat Bellies getting drinks and stuff. You know, I was literally <laughs> just as Fat Bellies before you said it. It's a new spot now. It's a, it's a tapas spot in Providence now. And I was there last week with somebody. I'm like, Steve, you should love this place. Fat Bellies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so, we, you know, before you know, we'd go out and get drinks, and obviously a friendship blossomed from there. And then I did some traveling with him as well. I went to Germany with him. So that's, just, that's just the backstory. So yeah, people yeah, know yeah. who this Dan Clark person is. You can Google him. You'll see him all over Google. Yeah. He's everywhere. He's on He's Forbes as well. Forbes 30 under 30. He's done great things um, with, with Brain FM. So I came into Brain FM. Um, there was about seven people in the company. I built up the customer support department. I, I started doing email marketing for Brain FM, started doing everything, op operations, hiring, et cetera. While you were still in Massachusetts? No, I moved to New York, actually. Okay, so we just get that part. So you, he reached out to you. you he was like, FedEx, yeah. And you, were just, you were like, all right, I'm done with FedEx. You dropped at the dime, went to New York. How was that transition? Was it quickly? Was it, you know, were you nervous or what was that? It was wild. So um, in that, at that time, I, um, so... I have a sister who lives in, in France. She lives in Paris. And, excuse me, before I said yes, like a good six months before then, I committed to running the Paris Marathon. So I bought the tickets. I, st I was like midway through my running. And, and Dan was like, yeah, would you move to New York, though? We're trying, I'm trying to like start up, 
you know, an office culture. Pre-COVID, by the way, he's trying to start up an office culture in New York. And, and yeah, he, and so I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I moved, I, I literally, like, for two weeks, I was staying in Dan's room. He had a roommate as well. So I was, like, sleeping on the floor of his room um, and then got uh, an apartment in Brooklyn. Things people don't know about when they're like, wow, Steve's living the life. They don't know <laughs> yeah. what you're doing to get to that life in the first place. So you just quit FedEx, you're training for the, the marathon, and then you move to New York at the same time. Yeah, moved to New York. I absolutely stopped running. Because I was like, I have a new job. I'm trying to find a place to live or like trying to settle in. Um, and and I have, yeah, I absolutely stopped running. So come time of the marathon, I was dying like at mile like 20. <laughs> but like, I was like struggling through it, like full body cramps. Because the most I ran up to that point was like 15 miles or so. And so I was like struggling to do the other 11 <laughs> miles. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, I moved to New York. Um, and... Um, and, and yeah, it, and it started working with him and his team and really getting to learn what, um, what a SaaS company was, like what is like the tech world and, you know, just how, how wild and quick and crazy it is. And we are like a scra scrappy startup of just crazy it is, working so fast and like, yeah. Which, so taking that leap, leaving FedEx, cause that's a, that's a other hard left turn. You were like. You're talking about fear and stuff like that, and you kind of just go for it. There was no type of fear in your body at all. You were like, "Fuck if I if I fail, I fail." Or there was what was going through your your process in your own head, though. Like, yeah, you did it, but like, you weren't nervous. Like, did you, who did you talk to before you made that leap? Were you talking to your sister who moved to France, your mom, your dad? Like, what was that process even like to make that leap in the first place? It just felt right for me. I honestly just remember telling my mom, like, "By the way, I I said yes to this job. By the way, in two weeks I'm moving," and everyone was like what um so when they're saying what you're not like oh fuck they're right like what like yeah i mean every step of the way i had doubts right even even before i started i made sure to meet with the team and i was looking up i remember googling of like what does an operations person in tech do and i was like it's a completely new field yeah thing, i was so like you don't know at all what do i have to do what do like i have to learn so i was like all right i need to meet with all the people all right, I need to make sure all the systems are in order. What's a system? Before you accept. So you, before you accept the position. Or you do No, I accept it. I accept it. I accept it. Fuck it. Yeah, I was like, fuck, I want to learn how to do it. Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you know who, uh, I know you're like kind of familiar with uh, wrestling, but Paul Heyman, he, I love that dude. He's so like, motivational, inspiring. He had, just goes for it. And he says, like, uh, a bunch of documentaries he's done and podcasts I've listened to. He's like, you know what? If someone t asks you, can you do this? Yes, I can. Do I know how to do it? No, but I will learn on the job. I will learn before I go there. Fake it till you make it, and you will learn on the fly. So yeah. that's basically what you were doing. One hundred percent. Can you do this? Yes, one hundred percent. Fuck it. One hundred percent. YouTube like, University, Google University. I'll figure I'll, it out. Figure it out. Or die trying because, like, I think again, the the biggest thing for me was like not trying. I was more scared of like my own self saying no and just like the, like the what ifs and all that. So I'm like, no, I'm gonna give it a shot. Whatever, I'm gonna move to New York. Like worst case scenario, I'll I'll, I'll move back and rethink something. Yeah, because at that point, realistically, what are you losing? You're losing the FedEx position. And no offense to anybody who works at FedEx. You said it was they cool have great job, benefits. Great but, benefits. Yeah, but at that point, back. you're like, you know what? I could realistically always go back to FedEx. Maybe UPS, or whatever. At the same time, like, what am I really losing in that aspect? You don't know where you're gonna, you know, the next chapter may lead to where Brain FM is going to lead to. Yeah. So you're in Brain FM. You're there. You're now in New York. What's this process like being in New York, being in a new city, new job environment, new people you don't, you've never met before, everything. Yeah. So what, what's it like at this point in your life? I mean, it was, it was pretty sick, honestly. I loved it. I, I embraced it um, because, like, I was born in Queens, so it feels like coming back home to me. It always felt right. Um, and it, I mean, it was a bit overwhelming, but nothing, nothing crazy. Um, I, I was more so just obsessed with, getting the work done like there was an endless amount of work that i i always had to like you know eventually do like there was a backlog of things that i had to do so i just i got uh, like i i i um i i really kind of fell in love with the idea of just like continuing to work and figure it out and like learn those key skills that if i fail I'll still have underneath me. Mm -hmm. If I fail, I still have underneath me. Kind of been like your entire process this entire time. You do something, you know what? I'm 
you've learned something every single chapter of your life. So at this point, like you said, you're going to learn something no matter what. You yeah, and it was something. rocky as hell, man. Like, first first three months, I wasn't doing well. Like, you know, I, and even I always I was always able to keep my, my like, friendship with Dan separate from the business. So... Like, I think that's so key. Like, it, you have to. You have to. Business and like personal. You know, like a lot of people don't have that business sense where, you know what, we can talk about something business wise and friendship wise, and a lot of people can't differentiate the two. Yeah. And it's super important. It's very difficult to do. So it's very difficult to do. But I think we're, we both were able to kind of um, put it that way. And yeah, I wasn't performing that well. You know, I, I, barely knew what I was doing. The only thing that I knew really well how to do was customer service that I, again, I like knew how to talk to people in a customer service way because I've had people at the gym scream in my face mm -hmm. about being un unhappy about a particular membership that they had. So I was like, okay, I know how to do this. So I just started there of like, all right, what are my strengths and how can I build this up when, and, and kind of like, all right, th this thing, I at least I'm going to, if I leave the company in whatever aspect, I would have built this. In that moment in time, though, are you like, like if being real, I mean, is it hard to self-reflect in those moments? Or are you like, you know what? Dan's being an asshole. I'm right. He's wrong. Or are you like, you know what? Let me, a lot of people can't do that neither. You said that's where like the friendship and the business sense and gets hard. You're like, Dan's being an asshole. Or are you like, you know what? Let me self reflect. Like, was it really, was it hard for you? Oh, or was, were you it, stubborn or? It was hard. Um, and we were both growing, I think, you know, like he, he was, he was growing in, in his position to be able to manage, um, manage people, manage a friend like me. So, and I was also growing in the same position. So we both made mistakes. Uh, we both, you know, learned from it. Um, it was very difficult. Um, I, I'd say to, to, to be able to, to, to have that confidence. Yeah, I think so. You know, coming in from nothing. Um, and then slowly you build that over time, you know, slowly, like you, you start, you start getting more confident as you start getting those wins. So for example, I, I built up the, the customer support department. As I said, I hired like four people underneath me. We had, um, we had these metrics that we tried, we tried to impact. So whenever you write in, um, and, and, uh, whenever you write into support and they reply back, we would look at, all right, what is the response time that, you know, of a ticket? What is the happiness score? So on the bottom, you could put in like a happiness, like green, yellow, red, or like happy. Like we're trying to get above 90% happy. We're trying to get X amount of people to, to review the app, to give ratings for the app, to refer their friends. And I was really honing in on like, all right, um, so that I don't have to like be confused. So I don't, so I can get more confidence in myself. What are numbers that at the end of the day, I could say, I push that from 60% to 90% and that's black and white. So I was like looking at more of those things of just like for my own confidence more than absolutely anything of just like, you know, I, I need to be able to find somewhere on paper where I'm making an, an impact. Otherwise, if I take it from, you know, the way that it's reflected in my conversations with other people, you know, someone could be just having a bad day and respond a particular way. And then I'm like, oh, crap, am I doing something bad? And then, like, you know, you might act a certain way because of that. And it keeps going, you know, it leads in the wrong direction. So what I tried to focus on was, again, like, what are those numbers that are black and white that I could lean on in times of turbulence and stuff and, and get that confidence underneath me? Yeah, for sure. So do you think, like, um, so that's how you improve? Is, is that how you say you would improve in that position? Yeah, I mean, it, I, it. you take a look at... Some, you, said, you, said, you said it was Rocky Road, so how did the Rocky Roads, you know, become smooth? Yeah, I mean, having clearly defined goals, right? We would sit, we would sit with each other of just like, this is what the position is at this moment right now. And, you know, with a startup, it changes, right? Like, what's needed of you six months ago in like a small startup may not be what's needed uh, of you in the following six months because like the business might have shifted, you know? It's like things move incredibly fast. Um, but it's like within these, you know, these six months or so, these are the things that are expected in this position. You are expected to have, you know, like, a, uh, review systems for all the employees. You're like hiring, whatever, you know, um, if you imagine customer support, they're supposed to have this, that, and the other. If we're going to do email marketing campaigns, it's supposed to have, you know, like this type of result and, and really having those, like those metrics, those, um, uh, we call them like report cards, so to speak, like back to school of like, what are the marks that you need to hit? 
Um, and I think that's fundamental of, of a lot of businesses, right? If you, if you focus on, on metrics, then it gets a lot of like the politics, so to speak, out of it. A lot of like the, yeah, like the relationship, like it leans on relationship more things out of it because it's just like you're either doing your job and you're not and like numbers are, are less likely to lie than, 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 than people are. Yeah, people are feelings are. You know, you know, a lot of people get their feelings into it. So that it was your second to last job. So now what did you learn from that to your current position? Oh, everything, man. Everything. Absolutely everything. I mean, the company that I'm at, I'm at right now is in the tech field. Um, I I started doing the, the emails at Brain FM. I knew nothing about email marketing. And I found out real quick how incredibly profitable it is to an, a business, how incredibly profitable it is to an industry. Um, especially if you're a consumer brand, because every email that you send out, every sale that you make, you're having, you know, potentially thousands of people purchase. And then you see the revenue that comes from that. And you're like, damn, I did that. Or like our campaign did that. Our team did that. And, and that's, that's what really fueled me. I got super excited about that. Like, you know, there's, there's different campaigns or, or what I love the most back to thinking back to to the gym of like the experience of when someone comes in when someone comes in for the first time and they're experiencing your product there's a series um it's called the onboarding sequence is what you know what it's typically called so there's like communications that goes out to you and you um you guys will notice if you whatever app you download there's typically a welcome email if you put your your email in and then a couple days later you might get another email that's people onboarding you to their product so that onboarding sequence of like while you're still trying to learn the product of getting you to use the product ultimately to your own benefit right we're making functional music, focus music to help you focus, relax, and sleep. It was backed by neuroscience trying to educate you. And then at the end of the day, we're a for-profit company having you purchase a membership. Um, so like, I really like being able to, to um, adjust some of that messaging, some of that messaging, um, and, and really be able to impact the business that way, being able to impact people that way, and being able to see, for example, like if I put my face as a video of a welcome video, like, hey, I'm Steve from customer support, welcoming you in, this, that, and the other, and I'm like, wow, it drove this much more people to, to purchase, or it drove this many more people to start a trial, and, and that was super exciting to me. So I'm like, you know what? I can go in on this. This is actually an industry. And this is the part of the job that gets me the most excited. Um, and, and I'm like, I've been all over the place kind of my entire life. I want to focus on this field. And, and so I decided, you know, um, I decided to move towards that, that realm. Um, and, and, and now I'm at a, uh, at a place called, uh, called 10% happier, which is a meditation company and really being able to show people, um, that meditation is, isn't like this far away place. You know, you don't have to be in like a perfect spot with your feet crossed to be able to meditate. Um, the company that, that I work for is that was actually founded by this guy called Dan Harris, who had a panic attack on the air. Oh sheesh! He had the panic attack on the air. He was um he was a an anchor, uh, for Good Morning America, and he had a panic attack on the air. He went on this journey towards meditation, and he was like, he's like an atheist, a skeptical. He's like, this is for Instagram moms and Pilates teachers, and and he really like found meditation to be something that like, you know, ten x his life. And the entire and the entire thing is like. You know, to start meditation, you shouldn't think that it'll make your life black and white, right? He's like, to start, it'll make you 10% happier. And that's where the company comes from. Dope. Yeah, that's crazy. That's the full story. If anybody wondering what Steve did his, his life to fund these travels. And um, yeah, that's a dope story. I mean, that's the entire thing. I mean, what would you have changed anything of that story of your journey? Honestly, the only thing that I think of is like, is like, damn, I wish that um, that clean energy startup kicked off, <laughs> cause like, how would you have, how would it have kicked off differently? You think just the mindset of the scientists, maybe, or I had to find a, I would have had to find a way to speak his language and find a way for him to trust me enough to not be in the process for that, which is probably an impossible task. But I would have had to find a way to put it in his terms and like break through eventually, and that's through like. 
at the time, and I'm still kind of this way. I could be a little bit hard headed and a little bit like thick headed. Like, no, it's like my initial reaction is like, what really? And like, if you come back at me with heat, I'll come back at you with heat. So, so like it was, it was kind of that, that type of thing, but I really needed to be more, I think more compassionate, you Mm -hmm. know, and more just like, this is this guy's baby. He's like survived off of making inventions and like not necessarily even selling them of just like, you know, maybe, you know, doing other things with the inventions um, and really finding a way to do that because, um, you know, if it was bought up by one of the companies, you know, it, wouldn't have to uh wouldn't wouldn't have had to work for a while but but also at the same time I wouldn't have learned what I've learned you know and I wouldn't be in an industry and in a field that I really enjoyed working in would you like all this uh you know I think sometimes I think we both can get lost in like the middle of what we're doing and we don't appreciate like where we'd gone in life and like just like that the chapters and stuff like that where do you think you find this inspiration from? Like, do, who would be your inspiration? Like, growing up, like you can attribute all this like hustle to. Oh, it's my mom, a hundred percent. My mom, um, she moved here from Colombia. You know, when I was super young, went to URI, started learning English, and then from there, she got a job as an accountant in in a bank in Everett, um, and she's been working there for like. 30 something years. No, sorry, like 25 years. And she's still like, she's like two years away from retiring, but her work ethic, like I was, I was back home a couple of days ago and she's still working super late. And, and I tried telling her like, ma, you're old. Like you need to like, just phone it in. Like, you know, the, you need to phone it in. But she's at the point where she's like, she was telling people like, no, I don't feel comfortable taking a day off and letting this guy do it because he doesn't know how to do things right. And she's like working. Like, damn, it's me. Yeah, I'm like damn. <laughs> I'm like I'm not hard headed, man. Damn. So it's definitely her. Um, I, I find a lot of inspiration too. I had I have an older sister who did all of these like adventurous things as well. At, right out of college, first of all, she's brilliant. She went to Cornell. Um, got a scholarship to go to Cornell, uh, which is one of the Ivy Leagues. From there, she she actually didn't use like her degree. She went to Japan to teach English, which was wild. And she was living there for like five years, speaking full Japanese. Dope. And and yeah, so I was like, I would always see her, and I'm like, wow, like she's, you know, she just like doesn't. She's like living in an amazing life. And then she moved to France, and now she she lives in Paris, and she's a cit- a French citizen. She's been there for like. Uh, like twelve years or so, um, is more French than English. And I say it has like a little, a little uh, poodle and everything, a little toy poodle. Oh, she's in the life. Yeah, yeah. So All in the culture. So having that as well of just like you know uh, of of always having those role models, you know, powerful women that that I've grown up, um, you know, really admiring the way that 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 they went through life and and you know their struggles and seeing those struggles. But also seeing like you know the results of of working of of really working hard and putting yourself in the things that you do. No, I love I love to hear that. I mean, um, you know, me and you, I think both like we weren't in the top of our class academic wise. I mean, do you ever feel some type of way? I mean, um, you know, being not being at the top of your class and then doing what we're doing now, thinking you no. Know, I'll talk uh, our shit for both of us where I think we're both doing pretty well in life. Did you, if you ever talked to anybody back from high school or like teachers and stuff like that, do you feel like any type of way someone like talks to someone back from high school, you haven't talked in a while and they're like, wow, you're doing that. Do you feel like some type of way, like disrespected or anything like things along those, things along those lines where people are like, wow, Steve, you're doing this right now. You've been traveling like that and you're doing this in life. Nah, dude, I was a chiseler. Um, in high school, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like my freshman year in college too. Like I, I was partying a lot. I dropped every class, but like writing and it, it was only, uh, or in college. And it was only thanks to finding the, like fi- to finding Forex where I like corrected myself. So finding something that I love. So I was very much on the, on the, like a, a really bad path. I think I was fortunate to kind of correct myself or to find a correction and then work from there. So I don't, I don't feel any type of way, honestly. And like, let people think whatever they want to think. I, I brush things off all the, like all the time, like whatever, it happens. Uh, to be honest. Yeah. And I'm a completely different person than I was then. So I wouldn't expect anyone to kind of see that. If your biggest hater wrote a book about you, 
what would the title be? Damn. Damn. I don't know. You better ask them. <laughs> How am but I supposed to know that? If you think, you're, if you were your biggest hater, what would the title be? I don't know. That's the answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love to hit people with that question. I love to see people with what their thoughts are. But yeah, no, that's a... <laughs> you know for sure <laughs> um, my title of my book would be i said it before in the podcast but it would be oh really effie oh, i love that oh really da 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 effie question mark and it's like yeah bro like i'm the diff i'm a different person i than i was in high school like similar person but don't think well like the past defines me that's a nasty title for a book by the way yeah because I think that's what, that book. when I be doing stuff, I think people really legitimately say that. Like, oh, really? Effie? Or Effie's doing this. I think that's probably genuine people's reaction, especially people from high school, teachers and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm not the same person I was 15 years ago. You know, like people change and develop. And, you know, I could have went the wrong path. You know, like you're saying, like you could have possibly went down. But, you know, I think I learned and corrected it. And, um, you know, I'm trying to do and venture out to many different things and opportunities as I possibly can. So that's definitely my title of my book. Um, one thing I like to say, I, I like to do on the podcast, get flowers while people are still alive. Um, you know, we've had plenty of talks of how we feel about each other, but we can have it on the pod, on the YouTube, just in case anything were to happen. I can start off first if you want to think about it, but, um, you know, anything you want to say to your buddy, the young Lexington Keith Sweat on camera. Get flowers when people still alive. Yeah, hundred percent. I think uh, you as well. You've been the most authentic person, um, and and honestly, like I, I love not only traveling with you but just talking with you about life because like your perspective is is uh, observant. I would say, you know, you observe the way uh, the way that other people act. You observe the way that you know some haters are towards you, but also the way that. That some people aren't, and and you pick that up in, in a nice way, like yo, I really appreciate that you did X, Y, and Z, and that you know that shows that that you care, and you've always been there, you know, for 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 me when I was through all the stages of like you know just someone to talk to about random things, you've been consistently a a, a good friend, so you know you always have a special place in my heart and in my apartment if you're ever by. <laughs> I appreciate that. And you also have a special place on my blow up mattress. If you ever need a place to stay when you come back to visit, um, same thing for me to you as well. Um, you know, we've been really good friends, um, for a very long time. I very, I would say I have a lot of friends and I think you are on the top of that list. And, um, like you said, I think our talks are always special. We had them behind closed doors, always one-on-one. -on -one. I feel like I can trust you with things. Um, you know, we have that definitely that special connection of definitely just uh, the same. We're so similar in so many different ways, mindsets on business and traveling. And, you know, I think we still have that, like that same compassion too, where we still, um, you know, can see people's train of thoughts and still have our own perspective as well. Mm. And um, like you said, I've been there for you. I think you've been there for me too. When I need someone to talk to and it can be, you know, we can, not talk for weeks or maybe I wouldn't say months, but sometimes, you know, we can get lost in doing our, both our own things. Cause I think we're both entrepreneurs that same, you know, on that same level. And, um, it's never weird. If there's ever a time where we don't speak for a little while, the best travel partner I could think of is you and Brandon are on the same level. And I mean, that's my brother. So, you know, you're on the same level as my brother where we never fight, you know, and people are like, Oh, where you see you traveling? How you guys travel so good together? I don't know what it is. We don't, we never fight. Mm. We never, uh, you know, get to argue with them like that. And, um, you know, I really appreciate, you know, just our bond and our connection and friendship. You know, I don't think, in, uh, yeah, I don't think I can ask or, you know, for a better friend in life. And um, just, you know, I, you know, I love you as a brother, as a friend. Um, yeah, you know, I appreciate literally everything we've ever done together. And, you know, we're going to have more travels. And um, you know, people ask me, what's my What's my favorite trip is Steve, and I'll say uh, the next one because uh, it's always going to be more. Uh, and every trip has been great, and um, yeah, you know, I think our friendship is great. And I want to let you know, bro, I love you like 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 a brother. Love you too, man. Yeah, man, I love for you sure. Too. Hey, love you, and um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy that podcast. We, that was just a tip of things. We haven't even talked about travel or anything along those lines. The, the man of many interests. We haven't talked about any of his interests. He still owes me a painting that he has never gave me. 
But um, yeah, no, I mean, I yeah, I love this podcast. It was definitely um, an insight into your life. I know people can enjoy that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, do you have any closing words for this pod? No, I love what you're doing here. This setup is legit. Um, you're a fantastic host, uh, and I love being on and just, yeah, talking with you. I'm happy to come on and, and talk about whatever, honestly. Yeah, man, I love it. I appreciate you coming through, and I can't wait to see our next trip together, baby. Actually, make sure you follow your boy at Montoya Mania on all social media. Make sure you download and subscribe to his new app. It is 10% happier. 10% happier, baby. You will be 10% happier. And you'll be 10% happier when you follow our travels on my social media, Explore FF. Make sure you follow your boy. Make sure you follow your boy, EG Pot of Thunder, on all social medias. Round it up. Send us to the moon on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Spotify, Apple Music, everything, baby. Ish, get it. <laughs>